Hi, everyone. Welcome back to New York Energy Week 2023. We are thrilled here to welcome you to the most dynamic and influential energy happening of the year. New York Energy Week by Enernol brings together visionaries, experts, and industry leaders from around the globe to explore innovative solutions and shape the future of our energy landscape. So welcome again to New York Energy Week here. Our virtual sessions are being uh, hosted here on our One Business World platform. And here we've been having uh, lots of discussions, the meeting of minds, the igniting of ideas, and as the energy revolution continues. We're now joined this afternoon, his very early morning, David Lacidio, who is the managing director of Sentient Hubs. He's joining us from uh, already tomorrow, Perth, Western Australia. Uh, good, 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 good morning, uh, David. Uh, uh, David's good morning, talk. Glenn. David's talk is risks and opportunities, quantifying and visual, visualizing climate change impact on water supply for energy. So, David, let me turn it over to you. We look forward to your presentation and your remarks, and I will join you on the uh, on the backside here. Welcome. Thanks, Glenn. Appreciate it. So, thank you everybody for taking some time today. I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, new approaches to quantifying and visualizing um, the impact of climate change on the water supply uh, for energy. We'll be looking at some of the risks, the opportunities, and, um, and, uh, and just looking at some practical ways to understand, uh, get a, a more holistic understanding of the issues of the day. So um, thank you. So a little bit about um, sentient hubs. We're, we're, this this um, this capability has been born out of uh, thirty years worth of uh, very much world world class environmental science from the Centre for Water Research. Um, we've spent the last five years extending the capabilities uh, beyond complex water system modelling, from at, you know full weather modelling to hydrodynamics, across to transport, energy, supply chains, um, and uh, financial modelling and really looking at system of systems impact modeling uh, more broadly. And really we have three, um, three primary areas, which is one, getting a, more, a better understanding of where we're at today um, so that we can understand how to optimize, how to orchestrate, how to uh, time uh, then um, um, investment decisions or divestment decisions and uh, looking at policy impacts as well. We've just been awarded um, the uh, state's prize for the um, the Woodside Energy Prize for the Western Australia for dynamic master planning to really start to have a, under, a better understanding, uh, evidence-based understanding of how our decisions, policy decisions, operational decisions are affecting the economy, the environment and the community more broadly. So just to get straight into the presentation, one of the things that I think is uh, poorly understood is uh, what's described as the water energy nexus. And so what we're seeing is that water and energy systems, and, I've, and I'll say more than just the systems, our engineered systems, water and energy ecosystems are intrinsically interconnected. And we're seeing water is used uh, across all phases of energy production and electricity generation. So this is not a, a, a trivial thing. It's very meaningful. And I think there's really opportunity to um, understand these interdependencies uh, uh, to improve outcomes. Uh, so when we now look at overlaying climate change and how climate change is affecting water supply for energy, um, what we're seeing paradoxically is that uh, basically, our water supplies are shrinking at the at the same time as we're uh, seeing more rainfall. So there are scientific reasons for this, um, uh, which we won't go into given the time constraints. Um, but often, when we start to zoom out at a macro level, uh, there are some counterintuitive uh, outcomes that are um, not obvious uh, uh, to us. And so, what we're looking at is how do we get a better sense for these impacts at a macro level and how can we drill down right down to that um, localized uh, level to understand um, both granular and macro um, in, in, a, in a broader sense. So this interesting concept of interdependency across domains, say water and power, um, actually extends well beyond that. And I just wanted to, to call that out, that really all of these so-called wicked problems are connected. And I, you know, people talk a black swan event and I like to sort of say, well, there's actually a, a flock of black swans and it's hard. 
Um, we're seeing, you know, climate change affecting water security, um, water affecting energy security, energy and water affecting food security, et cetera, et cetera. And that no, no, um, no one company, organisation, hyperscaler, government agency, none of us on our own can see that whole picture. And so really um, this is putting um, unprecedented demands on, um, on systems and um, at, at scale um, generically, it doesn't matter which jurisdiction you're in. So we're gonna talk about some new approaches to this. So now just to get into a couple of the interesting um, uh, points here around um, climate, water, energy nexus, is that it's complex and that um, these are complex and dynamic systems um, that really affect each other um, in, a, in a quite significant way. And the challenges for decision makers is that those interdependencies are poorly understood. We've got assumptions um, being applied inconsistently. There's a lot of, um, you know, at the edges where there's less certainty, we, we apply our intuition, best guess, rather than the science, which is, you know, it's the best thing we've been able to do uh, to date. Um, we've got a fragmented view of what, what is called situational awareness. So yes, we have a lot of systems which give us a lot of data, but do we have a unified way to see, see the whole picture? Um, you know, that, that's often lacking. And then it's, uh, that's within the governed environment. But then what about when we have these disruptions, these externalities, um, whether it's climate change or a, or a pandemic or some other factor, it's, it's hard to bring those um, shocks, you know, to test resilience. Um, and we're often, that makes us very reactive uh, rather than um, uh, being able to get ahead of these things. So in terms of um, understanding, you know, the emerging risks um, and and uh, before we get onto the opportunities and some use cases, really we're seeing um, that water shortages are increasingly likely to constrain operations um, in some areas. And um, you know examples of this were seen with with droughts in the US in two thousand and twelve, where these things um, unfortunately become all too real. Um, another one which is really getting a better handle on is the, the cascading and compounding impacts of enter the X events um, on you know, water infrastructure after loss of power, whether it's through a, a natural event or whether it's a cyber, whether it's wildfire, whether it's a, a combination of these um, um, uh, events uh, impacting the system uh, concurrently. Trends to do with population and regional migration, uh, which is impacting um, both energy and water systems. So we're seeing people shifting to the Southwest, et cetera. New technologies, energy, water, um, shifting demands, um, patterns, uh, EVs. There's a whole range of things there which we which we could look at. And then the other one, which is hard, is is an increasing actually exposure at a um, at, at a at a director level, at a policymaker level, is really understanding um, how to navigate um, uh, the the various. Uh, emerging requirements around uh, compliance and social license and uh, a range of um, um, uh, SDGs, TCFD, TNFD, et cetera. So it, it is hard um, and leadership. So my preference today was to, to focus on strategic, the strategic uh, challenges rather than operational decision support. This is really around how do we help um, the lay, the policymaker, the you know, an executive who may not be an engineer or a data science or understand the physics of climate science, um, to deal with disruption, competing agendas and pressure, limited time to get there, and so this is um, essentially the the space that we're focused on is to help um, understand again what's going on within your governed or controlled environment, what's happening at those interfaces, and what's happening, uh, what's affecting those from the outside. Um, our readiness and resilience to these things and how do we get to a point where we can start to anticipate or pick up on lead indicators ahead of the data sets. In fact, this is a really key focus in terms of stress testing at a whole of system, both the current system and potential future systems. Climate in, uh, impact scenarios, which I'll show you some use cases for in, in a moment. Um, you know, the optimal energy mix for today might not be what we need tomorrow. So being able to understand uh, multiple scenarios and um, across different um, uh, uh, time frames uh, and uh, technology options uh, and demand options is is critical. 
sustainable pathways to net zero because you know lots of promises lots of pl pledges um, but how are we going to get there and how are we going to do it in time so I'm not seeing a lot of practical um, ways and I've made, put a little asterisk here next to sustainable because it's more than environmental it's got to be sustainable economically and sustainable you know really more broadly than just um, you know uh, one dimensional so it's about understanding the trade-offs and and how do we prioritize those trade-offs between economic environmental and and social needs um, you know for jobs and a community and we've spoken about the compliance needs so the the department of energy has suggested you know put forward six strategic pillars um, in terms of addressing this water energy nexus I, I won't go through them all in detail but basically there's there are opportunities to optimize um, the, the how we use fresh water the efficiency um, energy in terms of water management reliability and resilience safe um, use and productive use of non-traditional water sources um, and promoting responsible operations and the last point here about productive synergies um, around water and energy systems is really interesting and we're seeing um, some of this occur in Australia where there's uh, consideration for a co-location of distributed um, uh, smaller scale operations um, between uh, connecting water and energy together to remote communities. So we've talked about the, some of the risks, some of the opportunities and some of the real challenges. Um, uh, but really here what we what we're trying to what we're going to shift to is how do we visualize this impact of climate change on water and energy uh, I, and so I guess some questions just to challenge is you know how much of that of that situation can we actually see how much of, across the water infrastructure energy uh, infrastructure can we see can we zoom out and see this at a system of systems level or are we just seeing parts of these you know assets or utilities or transmission so that's a question um, how well can we anticipate disruption or stress test at that systems whole of system level and then how rapidly can we you know plan adapt and um, um, essentially uh, rather than reacting to to events getting getting ahead of it so um, there are a number of barriers to um, to this in terms of both the data and the models it's it's not that they're not available we ha I, I'm convinced that we have more than enough data and we've got specialist expert models they're just not designed to talk to each other um, and they're very uh, they're complex and uh, it's not trivial to um, uh, when people say well it's all siloed well it, it, for many years for decades people have tried to create uh, unified models which have problems um, um, for lots of reasons and so there are there are emerging ways in fact we have really uh, uh, we're able to demonstrate a way that allows us to connect overcome those interoperability issues by uh, allowing expert models that are not designed to, to talk to each other to come together to solve bigger problems and do it through automation without dumbing anything down or taking anything away so it's it's allowing this concept of federated modeling where it's distributed it's done through uh, cloud um, and in a secure um, uh, way where there's trust where there's uh, autonomy and there's still um, co a collaborative environment uh, so there's a lot there which we won't get into right now but some options um, for you to consider. What, what I'm describing around systems thinking is an emerging approach um, to best practice. So um, we're seeing this conceptually being described. There's some work out of the UK, which is really describing this idea of under, getting you know, a better understanding across natural systems, um, engineered the built the services the policy out to the outcomes but it's not really been um, applied in practice and that's what we're focused on we're focused on actually taking that and and taking working with what we've got and we're calling it project tapestry where rather than keep inventing new new tools and new platforms how about we actually just start to connect together the things we've got the things that are tried and tested and validated scientifically and allow them to start to work together to solve the bigger questions um, so that's really um, I guess to set up some use case examples for you now 
um, <clears throat> some ways of how do we contextualize these insights? How do we get a view across, um, you know, whether it's at a utility or a regional, local regional level, or whether it's in the entire US grid in this case, how do we actually understand um, uh, these, for example, um, into the X, you know, so for example, if we have a, a hurricane off the Gulf of Mexico, the impact that that might have on um, in the south here, but at the same time, if we if we spin up a wildfire um, and push that in uh, or a cyber vector onto a hydro plant, this allows us to really start to test that resilience um, um, uh, in, an, in a way that it hasn't been seen before because of the ability to run the, both the, the simulations of physics and natural systems with the engineered grid. And the second part, which uh, I'm not sure how well you can see, is the ability to, for the lay person, to push and pull on different, um, let's call them levers. It could be policy levers or um, to, you know, to understand uh, some, some of the consequences of certain decisions at certain times. So, um, you know, let's say we want to pull back um, on coal or gas, which is, you know, everybody's uh, committed to. But the, the point here is if we make these decisions without understanding uh, the requirements for transmission or storage at a certain point in time, or how that decision at that time will impact on the price of electricity and the reliability, the stability of the grid, um, we can have unintended consequences, which see increases in um, power prices, um, putting duress on, on families. We can see uh, more blackouts and, um, and ultimately we've seen increasing um, um, burning of coal um, to, to resolve these, uh, these uh, uh, points. Just to show you another example of climate change, again, these, these have been historically uh, taken expert climate uh, people, modelers, uh, weeks and months to set up a configure, and we're now able to show um, essentially um, the ability to run these um, these models against you know near coastal infrastructure. In fact, you know it's not bound by any location. You can zoom out to a, a global right down to a hyper local level of different climate scenarios against infrastructure, against a, a context or a location, and understand risks uh, in that context. Um, around water, we've been very successful in showing um, this approach in Australia around the, the Murray-Darling River system, which is Australia's largest river system, um, which irrigates the food bowl of Australia. Um, it's a $16 billion a year challenge uh, managing water in this system. And this, um, this system, um, Sentient Hubs, is being applied to, to this to help the government understand what's called the annual permitted take, how much water can the farmers take uh, from the system uh, in, a, in, in a sustainable way. Similarly, here's an example of this integrated ecosystem modelling in, at the complex scientific end, where we've got a whole range of discrete specialist models being brought together. So Sentient Hubs is not, we're not modelers, but what we've got is the framework that allows any and any number of data, data sources, models, um, uh, platforms to be linked together to solve those bigger equations very quickly. Um, and again, here are some examples of how do we make it easy for our um, policy makers, decision makers to get a view on state water supply, what's available, what's the demand, what's the shortfall under the various climate scenarios um, with these sliders here. So economic climate, um, and this is just situational awareness, what's there before we even talk about orchestration or optimization. Similarly for energy, simple questions which are hard to answer right now. Um, uh, you know, if, if you want to have a look at in your state um, or region, what, what's the current supply and demand at, at, that, at that systems level? It's, it, the data's there, but it's just not easy to get to see in one place um, and certainly the inter interdependencies. So in terms of key messages, um, and, and I'm pulling really here from opportunities from, uh, that have been um, uh, nominated uh, by the, the, the US Department of Energy is that these, these systems, uh, across energy and water are interdependent. Um, climate change is affecting both the supply and demand for water and energy, and um, that 
there's the shocks and disruptions we're seeing are uh, um, really not going away. Um, and we, this need to have a more integrated approach to and collaborative approach to dealing with these challenges um, is really, I think, the opportunity of the day and um, where we need to, where we've got a, a responsibility, uh, I think, um, to, to work together. Um, and that's really, I think, um, uh, probably a good place for me to pause there, um, just to, to encourage a greater level of collaboration um, across uh, parties and stakeholders uh, and to understand different, different perspectives to see that uh, systems um, impact. Thank you. Thank you, David. Nice, nice, nice work. Nice job. Uh, tremendous presentation. Really appreciate your your contributions and, and thank you. Oh, you got a you got a context slide there at the end. Okay, Ter terrific. That's right. Hey, what wonderful, wonder, wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, you know, you, you talk about uh, the Department of Energy six pillars. Uh, any any of the six, any any particular one jumps out. I mean, you talked a little bit about productive uh, synergies. Uh, would you would you view that one as 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 probably the, the most important or combination thereof? What do you think? Yeah, I'd I'd say that is one of the most important, and um, the just just understanding those interdependencies. I think that's a great starting point, and because a lot of the times we try to go out too far to the right with uh, complex uh, solutions and new technologies. Uh, so I my what I've really learned is to to we need to we need to start with what we've got and and get a baseline understanding because it's very hard for us to start to understand what to do and how much to do in what sequence without understanding each of those. But the, and, and then we can start to look at those synergies and how to uh, leverage those uh, based on the resources we have, the technologies of the day. Um, and I think that's the other key point here is um, the energy mix we need for today to meet today's need, today's situation, it's different to what we need in five, 10 or 30 years. And um, so I think taking account of those multiple potential futures um, in how we, we, we set our, you know, we set our policy priorities and decisions is key. No, that, that, that makes, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Uh, you mentioned as part of your, part of your talk that we have lots of data, lot, lots of models, right? Um, but perhaps what's what what's missing is is that collaboration that you mentioned as as your kind of concluding point. Well, yeah. what's the what's the best way to go about that, and who might who might be a change agent for that type of collaboration? Is it is it at the company level? Is it governmental? Is it organizations or, or uh, societies? Is it is it is it venues like New York Energy Week? I mean, how do you how do you how do you how do you, how do you see that coming together? We're getting some legs going forward. This is this is a really key point, and it's not a technical issue. This is a um, a need. To, there's a need to understand um, that there's a way of approaching this where everyone has their own interests, but there's a version of this where there's a higher order why, and understanding how the benefits to that company, their shareholders, or this uh, or their um you know their um their the community, by working together, we can actually start to show that we can lift the whole system up. And so the, the ability to be able to um, have both competitive forces working within the same environment, but actually contributing and leaning in and sharing in a trusted environment where they're safe to do so, meaning there are competitive drivers that can't be um, mis, you know reduced down, but there's ways to... Um, to have conversations and it's going to require all of these things and this is why we're here and this is why i'm here at uh, early hours of the morning to help to create awareness that there that it's not a technical issue the the mechanisms are there but we really need leadership and um to socialize and to these forums are, are a great opportunity to start to get those conversations going and i'm getting to the point now where i'm saying look if we're serious about this if it's really urgent well okay so so what? Because I'm hearing a lot of promises, a lot of pledges, but I'm not seeing a lot of practical 
pathways to achieving some of these goals. Um, so that's that's kind of I'm 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 getting a little bit more you know serious about how, how we encourage that conversation at, at all levels, all well, levels. You know, you know, you think about uh, and it came up uh, last night on on our kickoff kickoff panel live uh, uh, here at here in New York. Um, you know, you look at you look at ESG right, and the G's always been uh, for governance, and kind of what you just described kind of really is leading practices in governance, just kind of across numerous, you know, numerous organizations, numerous companies kind of kind of putting their best foot forward here from a from a collaborative standpoint, uh, which is which which is which is important, which is important because you can't be and I think you had on a couple of your couple of your points, you can't be siloed, right, you really have to and that's yeah. what struck me when you first started off, you said this is holistic situational awareness. Right. It's not it's not necessarily a technical discussion. It's more of a more of a mindset, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. And our challenge um, and we're, I think we're beginning to get there for a lot of reasons, both there are institutional, there are social license issues. We found it very hard to find who is the natural um, steward, who cares, who's got visibility across water. There is no single um you know that that ownership and whether it's a legal obligation or commercial interest, it hasn't been easy to find. Regardless of that, there is a need um, to to understand those interdependencies for some of the reasons I talked about. So really, this does need um, um, sponsorship and leadership at at the right levels, you know, organisationally, but in government, to um, to be able to understand across portfolios. Um, the implications, and that's what I'm really trying to share. And I, you know, appreciate the opportunity to share that as well to to encourage um, that type of thinking. As you say, it's it's more about a, a, an, a, an, a, an approach rather than it being a technical issue. And so finding who who's willing to have that conversation a, a, above and outside any one particular portfolio has been a challenge. But we're seeing um, in lots of drivers. I won't say forcing, but increasingly driving a need for that. Yeah, a phrase, a phrase or a word you often hear in, in situations like this is, is, is the word stakeholder, right? And, and that's really kind of what, what you're describing. It, it's, it's, across, it's across platforms, it's across companies, uh, maybe even a, a, a larger word, community, when you come yeah. back and, and, you, and you think about those, those that, are, that are affected by it. Um, one of the other pieces that came out in last night's talk was was kind of the swapping out of the s in esg and and the uh and i'm forgetting um the, the person who mentioned it but um the s the substitute s was sustainability and i think that's certainly uh and i think that's an important an important word when you think about uh long-term impact long-term uh effort and potential and potential results when you look at when you look at the risks and opportunities here across across the climate and water uh, and energy as well, how important is sustainability in in, in your view? And, and what types of things might uh, people be able to do to if they don't have that kind of mindset or if they're too short term? How do you how do you get them to focus on on the long game? So, the first thing is to really what do people mean when when they use the word sustainability? Uh, there's almost a default, a natural tendency to think about that around environmental sustainability. Um, my view is that we need jobs, we need clean air to breathe. It's, it's, it's economic sustainability. It's balancing that with environmental and then social. You know, we, we, we've got children and grandchildren. And um, so all of those things go hand in hand. The real challenge is understanding the trade-offs and the balance between economic, environmental, and social, and that that's that changes over time. And so, to helping our policymakers understand implications and model for consequence of understanding if they're projecting forward decades, because the infrastructure we're talking about, the investments that are being made, they're being made often off the back of a report that is a static report that was, took two years for all these experts to come together, and it's out of date. And it doesn't. It reflects a version of a particular future, and that to me is folly. We there is 
it's too hard to pick any one of those. So what we're saying is, how about we actually run multiple scenarios against multiple potential futures with different, there are too many, too many variables, it's too complex. Um, and, and then as we go forward, we can reset, we can calibrate, we can, what's material, we don't have to look for boil the ocean or bring, there are a million factors that affect an outcome or sustainability or economic, but what are the material major factors affecting, um, you know, affecting what, what are we optimizing for? And that's what we're, we're doing. We're starting with question led, context led, then we're looking at the factors affecting that outcome. And then we look at the relevant data sources, the relevant models and systems. And rather than trying to bring everything in, we're just bringing in, what do we need to solve for that bigger equation? And then how do we need to flex that um, as conditions change or there's some other external impact or shock to the system? We can update our assumptions much more quickly. So it's a shift to a dynamic strategic or dynamic master planning. And that's what we want Innovator of the Year for because whether it's at a, at a port or a utility or a water utility or, or the city or the state, we have these master plans which are updated once every five years and we base these multi-billion decisions, uh, dollar decisions on them. And um, there's, there's really this shift to saying, okay, what if that could come to life and we can actually see and adjust the baseline assumptions for different trajectories or different climate scenarios much more easily. And rather than finger in the wind, we can actually bring some science because that is really a, where my heart sat is that we've got incredible science and incredible research all over the world and the ability to start to leverage and tap that and bring it together to solve problems, whether it's in the US, India, Africa, Australia, because we're all, there's no dotted line kind of um, stopping these impacts. Um, that's what we're really talking about and we're launching um project tapestry to do exactly that to bring together these these um, expert models and um whether they're students universities agencies hyperscalers startups to 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 accelerate some of these needed um innovations leveraging what we've got not waiting eight years for a new platform yeah now you know uh master planning calling it master planning or thinking of it that way and that goes to your 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 systems thinking kind of kind of kind of uh kind of holistic approach make makes perfect sense and the fact that that you again you said there's really there's really no boundaries there's no borders i mean we, we experienced this here in uh in new york last week with the wildfires up in up in canada i mean you know two weeks ago wednesday you could you couldn't you couldn't breathe here in, in the new york area the orange the orange smoke came in right and yeah, and you almost yeah. needed to have it come out. And you know, you think about master planning as well. And you're looking ahead, and it's it's got to be, you know. And you said, and it's true. Sustainability really you have to balance economic, fiscal, community with it uh, mindset. But you you think about um, trying to project out, and and you see this a lot in the transportation industry. And and again, coming from the New York area, the moment they finish our roads, right, and they declare victory, it's already obsolete. Right, it already comes yeah. back and says, "Hey, that's great that you cool. built the Long Island Expressway, but but that you started 12 years ago and you didn't really think about capacity or look look ahead, right?" And all of a sudden, yeah, yeah we play, yeah. we're just kind of playing catch up, you know, as it as it as it as it works yeah. out things for uh, on on that side as well. You know, the uh, you had one other comment that I thought, and this this just underscores how how hard it's got to be when you think about it. Uh, you know, we often hear the the the, the phrase, "Oh, it's a black swan." Mm. You brought in a flock of black black swans. That's that's yeah. that's that's yeah. gotta be that's gotta be daunting, a daunting challenge to come back and, and, and take a look at all of that for sure. Yeah, that's that's uh the reality we're facing. Um what were you know, these the 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 networks, the infrastructure, whether it was water or electricity or uh has was designed for that one in a hundred year event. But we're seeing these events happening with far more frequency nowadays and the the risks um, of collapse, the risk of cascading impacts well, and the disruption societally uh, that can be caused when we start to apply some um, pressure, you know, to these, these, um, this infrastructure that was just not engineered for what we're seeing. Um, it is concerning, and I think there's an urgency around getting a, a, a far better understanding of our readiness and then options. And 
and beyond master plan, we're talking about dynamic. So, you know, how do we actually dynamically understand those options and uh, consequences under different conditions? So that flock of black swans, unfortunately, is all too real. That's the world. Uh, if, if, you're a, if you're at a sea level, if you're at a board level, um, in the past, we we're able to kind of do our best, uh, assimilate what was going on around us and make make some decisions uh, based on that. Nowadays, it's just, it's it's overwhelming. Um, I talked to a lot of directors of boards who are, who really, you know, privately they'll, you know, they're struggling. They're really overwhelmed by just understanding, um, you know, how and what to do. Um, and it's, it's not because we lack again, the, the data or the models or the, or the, the many consultants is that, um, there's not really clear practical advice about how to get there. Um, given the resources people have. And again, that's why I think we really need to take a more systems uh, approach and a more collaborative view to some of the shared challenges um, without um, diminishing the need for everybody to be, you know, driving competition as well. And there's, you know, that's really what we're, we're exploring here, a, 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 an emerging framework. So I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, doomsday and uh, negativity out there, but I can see Glenn. You've got a good attitude as well. So uh, uh, it's nice to see a nice smile. So uh, I think we really need to 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 be, you know, stay ahead of some of these things and um, and leverage what we've got uh, rather than uh, you know look, despair. Yeah, I think I think you look back collectively uh, across the community. We you know. Uh, we we have the talent. We we have the technology. We we have the people, uh, and the systems to do it. I I think the the collaboration that you talked about, the foresight, the ability to flex, as you mentioned, I think is important. Uh, especially you look at again going back to governance, and you look at the the leaders of companies and boards. Sometimes perhaps the easiest part of the board meeting is well, how do we do last quarter? It's more the okay, what do we? Well, that's great, but what are we going to do next quarter or? next year or five years out, that new business yeah. part of the uh, piece often becomes uh, often very challenging. Well, well, listen, David, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, all the way from, from uh, Perth in Western Australia, joining uh, New York Energy Week here. David uh, Lucido from Sentient Hubs, excellent presentation. Thanks for your thoughts. Great, great work here on the collaboration front, and we wish you all the best uh, in the future. And thanks for joining uh, New York Energy Week here today. Thanks, Glenn. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.